Well, hello YouTube. It's me, Ford Master, and welcome back to another Game Theory Reaction. So, you know, if you're at all familiar with, you know, Game Theory, I'm pretty sure you're well aware of how much Five Nights at Freddy's has become their, for lack of a better term, their bread and butter. And in total, I think there's like, what, 57 Five Nights at Freddy's uh, Game Theory videos? It's like, it's absolutely nuts. And I pretty much watched all of them. So when I say that today's episode, FNAF, Golden Freddy never existed, I say it with all sincerity that, Matt Pat, you have some serious explaining to do based on what that means. <laughs> Without further ado, let's actually begin, shall we? What if I told you that everything we thought we knew about FNAF was a lie? First off, Matt, uh, that wouldn't be the first time <laughs> that we've been told that about FNAF. That Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy were never possessed. That the bite of 87 never happened. Heck, that the bite of 83 never happened. What if I told you that William Afton didn't die because some spirits harassed him in a back room, but because he got careless and wet? What if I told you that Golden Freddy never existed? You would all think that I was crazy, right? That after 60 episodes covering this series that I'd finally lost it, or gotten so desperate that I needed you to throw it all away and start again for content. But I assure you, I'm still here. Totally sane, or I guess as sane as I've ever been, and totally suspecting that some, maybe even all of the statements that I just made are a hundred percent true. So open your ears and listen to what I have to say, because once I'm done, none of us will look at this franchise the same way again. What are you Hello, on about? internet! Welcome to Game Theory, where am I? The only one that hears that weird humming sound. I think it's coming from the subscribe button. Can you help me smash it? Oh, thank goodness. It's that been was smashed for so many years, oh, Matt. I can't do it anymore. Out. Yep, probably not important. Today is a big day as far as FNAF Illusion theory desk. goes. Usually I'm here picking apart details from the newest book or trying to solve one very specific part of the franchise's history or reminding you that robot kids do in fact exist and Gregory is one of them. But this episode has a wider scope. It's bigger. It touches literally everything released in the franchise franchise thus far. I don't know if I agree with today's theory or not. I don't even know if I like today's theory or not. Scratch that, I do know. Kinda hate it, and what it means for the franchise. But regardless of whether you agree or disagree, love it or hate it, I am asking you to keep an open mind about it, because this one feels important. And the implications of it, if true, would certainly result in the biggest shakeup for the series since the conclusion of FNAF 6. Today, I'm asking you to take everything that you thought you knew about FNAF 1, 2, 3, and 4. Possessed animatronics, the crime child, the missing children's incident, the entire existence of Golden Freddy, take all of that and burn it to the ground. Maybe not burn it, we've seen that that tends not to work. Take <laughs> it all and put it through a paper shredder or something, will ya? Because none of it matters. None of it. It's all wrong. Or maybe it isn't. But before I explain why, I have to tell you that brand new Holiday Theory Wear is available right now. I decide now. to retcon it all out of existence. Uh, Instead of retcon, right. back in 2019, we got the release of Five Nights at Freddy's Help Wanted, otherwise known as FNAF VR. A game that, to this day, ranks as my third favorite from the franchise. On one hand, it was looking forward to the next phase of the series by introducing a new villain, Glitch Trap. But it also had its feet firmly planted in the past, a culmination of everything that had come before in a very little literal way, by collecting the first three games and turning them into VR experiences. It really felt like an inflection point for the series, a transition from the old story of a serial killer in a haunted pizzeria to the new stories it had yet to tell about the killer living on through technology. But buried in the game were some lines that made everyone stop and go, huh? Right at the top, we got this moment. We know that Fazbear Entertainment has developed something of a bad reputation, and while it's true that some stories associated with our name were loosely based on actual events, the majority of them were total fabrications oh. from the mind of a complete lunatic. Lawsuits pending. With the lunatic <laughs> shown on screen being, of course, a picture of Scott Cawthon himself. It felt like good meme fodder, a funny meta joke that also poked fun at Fazbear Entertainment papering over their bloody history. But then the game chose to double down. In one of the game's hidden lore tapes, we learned more about this lunatic spreading lies about the Fazbear restaurants. They lied to all of us. They told us that the whole point of this VR game was to undo the bad PR done by a rogue indie game developer. But that's not true at all. Fazbear Entertainment hired the game developer. Those indie games were designed to conceal and make light of what happened. It's an elaborate cover-up. It was 
weird. It seemed like FNAF VR was yeah, actively was. throwing into question everything we thought we knew about the franchise's lore. At the time, I went on the record to say this. If FNAF VR's tapes are to be believed, pretty much everything we know could all be thrown out as complete fabrications. The long story short here is that FNAF VR, in making Scott part of the Fazbear cover-up, is the franchise's way of rebooting the story. It's explicitly telling us that everything we've known up to this point is wrong. It's a distraction. And that's largely where the community left it. It was a bit of a weird call for the series to disregard everything that had come before, but honestly, it would have been fine. Here's the old original story arc with the first six games, and here's the new one moving forward. Two separate story arcs told within the same universe. Fine. Until Security Breach came out. Suddenly, Springtrap was a key player again, and we were exploring the burned remains of the FNAF 6 location, and the idea of the first six games being the crazed ramblings of a hired lunatic were largely forgotten as we were thrust yet again back into the story of the Aftons. Business as usual, only this time, there was Music Man! Yeah, so I that music was man. pretty much the status quo for the past year. But then, in late September, the unthinkable happened. We got another book. I know, I know, I said the B word. I'm sorry, but stick with me, this one's different. <laughs> you see, this one delivers on the hope that we've had for the books from the very beginning, that they would take small moments from the games and expand upon them to bring more clarity. Care to guess what moment from the games they chose to expand upon? The story of a rogue indie developer hired by Fazbear Entertainment to create a series of games covering up the company's shady past. And if there was any lingering doubt as to how this story fit into the games, the title was none other than Help Wanted. I'm about to summarize what exactly happens in the story, but the TLDR of it is exactly what we predicted back in 2019, that everything you thought you knew about the franchise is dead, just not exactly in the way that we thought, and it suddenly changes everything about how we should be approaching this franchise moving forward. In the story, we follow a character named Steve, an indie game developer stuck in a dead-end job while working on a quote, fetch quest-based game featuring cartoony chipmunks. Now, what could that be a reference Chipper to, Scott? Sons. Just like we hear about in FNAF VR, Steve is contacted by Fazbear Entertainment to create a series of games in order to help rebrand the company. At first, he turns down the offer. Not the company to take no for an answer, Fazbear then sets up an elaborate plot where they catfish Steve into a date with the woman of his dreams. During the date, he passes out, only to wake up and find that suddenly he's married to the woman and suffering from severe memory loss. This happens a few more times. Whoa. What? Fazbear Entertainment did this? What? Waking up to discover that he now has children, or that the house he lives in is being foreclosed. Suddenly, in desperate need of money, he contacts Fazbear Entertainment and starts making games for him. Four games, to be specific. All the while, a constant ringing is happening in his ears. Bit by bit, he becomes more sleep deprived. <sighs> okay, well, um, sorry about that. Uh, unforeseen consequences. X Fazbear Entertainment and starts making games for him. Four games, to be specific. All the while, a constant ringing is happening in his ears. Bit by bit, he becomes more sleep deprived and paranoid, which then feeds into his games. At night, he's haunted by night terrors, horrific monsters that keep popping out of the walls, which only pushes him to work harder. And throughout it all, the ringing continues to build, rotting his brain. Eventually, Steve oh God, discovers what's his, going on. The high pitched wife? sound that he keeps hearing has been creating illusions used to gaslight him. His house? Just a series of blank rooms. The Night terrors, amusement park jump scares coming out of the walls. His beautiful family, robots with plastic faces and wheels. Their physical description actually sounds a lot like the staff bots. Steve oh. is then given a choice of going okay. back to the miserable real world or returning to the happiness that he felt inside the illusion. He chooses the illusion, giving his robot wife a hug, who then stabs him to death. Oh, also there's a DJ on okay, the radio what? called DJ Dan. The music man! <laughs> it's not important to the lore, it's just for the memes. It is a super <laughs> sad story. It's also in no way a tale from the pizza plex considering the place isn't mentioned once but more than anything else it's a story that confirms some of our greatest fears about the franchise first and foremost illusion discs are now officially a thing in the games if you don't know what illusion discs are then good for you you clearly avoided reading the novels oh. i however not so lucky basically these things use high-pitched noises to trick the human mind into creating intensely real illusions of things that aren't really there a robot appears exactly like a human a pizzeria is more decorated than an actual is. Characters turn practically invisible on camera. These are all ways that they've been used in the books, but up until this point, we've never had a reason to believe that they were in the game universe. The the only time that I've suspected that they might be a thing in the games is this scene from Sister Location, when we remove a random flashing disc from Funtime Freddy's chest. It was just speculation at the time, but now, going back, listen to that scene. The chest cavity should now be open. Remove the power module from the chest cavity. 
great work. You hear it? The buzzing? That humming is only present in scenes where we're directly interacting with an <clears throat> animatronic in close proximity. Just saying, there might have been more evidence to suggest that these things were actually in the games earlier than we thought. But hindsight's uh, 2020. Yeah. With this new story, we know it's valid technology. And that has huge implications for things that we see throughout Security Breach. Like when we hear high-pitched ringing and have distorted vision anytime Vanny runs past us. Yeah. Why Glamrock Freddy apparently can't see Vanny until he gets Roxy's eyes. It's all much more likely now because she's using illusion discs. It may also play into the mystery of who Patient 46 is. In Retro CD number 15, we hear this clip. I have this still shot, the text pulled from the security footage, that recorded you in the pizza plex. That's you, isn't it? I know this image is distorted, but I think it looks like you. You're talking to someone or something. They almost look like rabbit ears. One of the consistent features of the illusion discs mm. is that they distort or blur any <clears throat> images that appear on camera. We see this all throughout the fourth closet. So the fact that the still image and the distortion are directly being called out here in the CDs indicate that patient 46 may also be hiding behind an illusion disc. Who knows, if my guess was right and Gregory is meant to be patient 46, that could be why he's appearing all blurry here in the camera shots from the DLC poster. Admittedly, oh. that opens up its own can of worms and contradictions. A lot of worms. Discussion. Yes. Like, why would he be clear in all these other pictures? I'm just tossing it out as something for us to chew on. Much more importantly, though, the Help Wanted story confirms that FNAF 1, 2, 3, and 4 are canonically video games within Freddy's fictional universe. They were created by a hired gun. A hired gun who, in the story, is confirmed to not be familiar with the events <clears throat> that happened at Freddy's. Quote from the story, It took a few seconds for the name Fazbear to ring a bell, but then Steve remembered the kids' pizza places that once had been wildly popular, but had suffered a downfall after a variety of criminal allegations. There had been talk of murders, though Steve didn't remember how many. There was weirder stuff too. Stories about paranormal events and that kind of nonsense. Steve doesn't actually know the stories and events that took place. He doesn't remember how many kids died. He doesn't believe in paranormal activity. He is an unreliable yeah. narrator, which uh. therefore puts everything in those first four games into question. He knew rumors of paranormal activity, so he created possessed animatronics. He knew about murders, so he put in mini games depicting kids being murdered. As for the facts though, he can't cannot be trusted. And the story tries to make it crystal clear that FNAF 4 was largely of his own creation, born out of the torture that Fazbear was subjecting him to. As his oh. hallucinations get more nightmarish, Steve starts seeing monsters literally appear out of the walls. One of them is described as follows, quote, It was the head of something. It was small, but bulbous and vain. Its large eyes almond-shaped with cat-like pupils. It lunged forward from the hole in the wall and parted its jaws to reveal a mouthful of sharp-looking teeth. Its pointed tongue darted out like a snake's when it sniffed the air. This moment isn't just to show us Steve's torture, it's to show us the influence that it has on the games that he's making. Look at the description. Does it remind you of anything? A character with cat-like eyes, a long pointed tongue, sharp teeth who likes to pop Nightmare out Foxy. unexpectedly. It's Nightmare Foxy from FNAF 4. Look at this picture from the teasers leading up into the game, especially the long pointed tongue. Who else pops out from the closet, from under the bed, from behind a TV in that game? Foxy. The book is spelling out for us why that game is so different, why it's no longer a game about fans Fazbear Pizzeria. The torture became so much that the story had shifted from being a Fazbear story to being a Steve story. Four games, one story. It's the clue that Scott gave us a long time ago during a live stream after the release of FNAF 4. At first, I suspected the line oh, was yeah. all about dream theory, that all of it was happening in the nightmares of a child. And I think that one was right. Then it shifted to the four games being about one family, the Aftons, as their kids grappled with the sins of their father. And I think that was also right. But now it's changed once again. It's now four games about one new story story, Steve's story. The story of a game designer that was being gaslit by an evil robotics company. You know, I gotta hand it to Scott. It's actually impressive how many times he's been able to make that single phrase describe the same set of four games. It also means that Scott gets to have yeah. his cake and eat it too. He gets to make those first- I mean, granted, I, I hate retcons and I hope to God that this none of this is actually true, but bravo for consistency. <laughs> four games the equivalent of dream theory without it actually being a dream. Oh, was the puppet referred to as a he in FNAF 2? Eh, Steve didn't know. Were there five victims? 10? 15 in that first set of pizzerias? Don't know. Steve's just making his best guess. But most importantly of all, it means that anything that doesn't physically appear in or after sister location and beyond is suddenly cast into doubt. And when you think about it, that includes some major parts of the lore. For instance, we know that Michael Afton is in fact a security guard for Fazbear Entertainment at some point thanks to the security 
security logbook. Plus, with Sister Location in FNAF 6, we know that he ends up getting scooped and dying yeah. in a fire. Sister Location also proves the existence of Elizabeth Afton and how she got scooped by Baby. But the third Afton kid? Crying Child? He's never been mentioned in any other game other than FNAF 4. I've made theories suggesting that he's the other spirit communicating with Cassidy in the survival logbook, but you know, that's just speculation because I assume that he existed. In FNAF 6's Midnight Motorist, there's reason to believe that he's the one who broke out of the house, considering that Mike in the chair says he's had a hard night, but again, that is pretty weak evidence. Honestly, mm. the closest we get to having physical evidence of his existence is in Security Breach's post-it room, where there's a dinner scene made up of five staff bots that appear to be simulating the Afton family, and one of those five is missing its head, which we've assumed represents the crying child getting chomped. But all of that evidence only stands because the crying child was thought to exist thanks to the first four games. Maybe that's why we've never actually gotten a name for him, because he was never meant to exist in the first place. And so Scott purposefully hid the name in order to allow the fifth Afton child's identity to remain anonymous, ready for a big plot twist when it turns out that he has another child, maybe a daughter, maybe called Vanessa. It's speculative as all heck, I'm just throwing it out there as a consideration. Henry and Charlie are definitely in this universe. We see Charlie's death in possession of the puppet thanks to the yeah. minions in FNAF 6, so that's all confirmed. But the missing children's incident where five kids were murdered at the FNAF 1 location? Unclear. It's likely that it happened, considering that in FNAF 6's lore keeper ending, we see five gravestones with one on a hill, the five missing children's incident victims plus Charlie, the six victims of William Afton. It's the same thing with Princess Quest. To move forward in the yeah. Princess Quest minigame, you have to light six gravestones. So it seems like those five murders happened, but then what about the extra five dead bodies that we see appearing throughout the FNAF 2 pizzeria? What about hearing that the pizzeria is getting closed down in the tapes? Even less clear. FNAF VR's main ending proves that William Afton is still the main killer in this universe and that he definitely stuffed kids into the animatronics. However, whether those kids go on to possess the animatronics is up for debate. Without the first four games being officially canon, we don't really have any evidence for their possession. But perhaps the biggest ripple effect of them all, this new understanding of the canon yeah, Golden heavily Freddy. suggests that Golden Freddy may never have existed. That's right, my favorite clickbait yellow boy <laughs> may not actually be a thing in this franchise at all. Consider this, Golden Freddy, while seemingly this super important piece of the lore to the franchise, hasn't shown up in a major way in any recent titles. He's only ever shown up in titles with questionable canonicity, like FNAF World, which is definitely not canon, Custom definitely. Night, which is Afton's personal hell, and FNAF AR, which isn't really canon. And if you think it is, then both Shamrock Freddy and Chocolate Bonnie are canon, and I refuse to live in a world where that could possibly be true. But in the main games, nothing. In Sister Location, his name is used in a Custom Night challenge. In FNAF 6, completely absent. And in Security Breach, sure, there's a golden Glamrock Freddy that you can collect, but there's a golden toy of every character that you can collect. In fact, I think Security Breach was outright trying to tell us that Golden Freddy has never been a thing. Of the dozens of collectibles that you can find throughout the game, plushies, figurines, keychains, sweaters, four of them actually seemed important. Three posters from Fred Bear's Family Diner, and an even older one from Fred Bear's Singin' Show. The Singin' Show is, I don't know man, it makes it look like the next game is gonna be a crossover with Bendy and the Ink oh, Machine. Oh god. But the Fred Bear's Family Diner ones are the ones that I wanna focus on now. Look at these things. One of them has the golden Bonnie with a purple bow tie, just like you'd expect. But the other two show us a brown bear with a black hat and a black bow tie. And you see, that is a huge detail. Up until this point, we've been under the impression that there were only two mascots at Fred Bear's Family Diner, Golden Bonnie and Golden Freddy. In FNAF 3, we see a Golden Bonnie and Golden Freddy performing together on stage. Similarly, in FNAF 4, we see Golden Bonnie and Golden Freddy again. It was always those two together with other characters like Foxy and Chica not showing up until later. So why then in Security Breach would they show us regular Freddy as the one on the Fred Bear posters? Unless he is Fred Bear. It's everything that we've been talking about today. Our uh evidence... Wait a second, I always thought that Golden Freddy was supposed to be in, like, Fred Bear. For Golden Freddy is all founded upon the original four FNAF titles. Games made by a guy whose brain was slowly turning to mush. But when you actually stop and look for the physical evidence of who Fred Bear was in the games that are still considered to be canon, all we get is a brown bear. Golden Freddy was never real. He never existed. I know, it seems wild, but it actually helps answer a lot of questions that we've had about Golden Freddy throughout this franchise. First off, his wildly inconsistent appearance. In both FNAF 1 and 2, he appears gold with a black hat and bow tie. But in the FNAF 2 minigame showing Charlie being killed outside Fred Bear's family diner, the Freddy we play as is brown with a black hat. More similar to the Fred Bear that we see in the posters for Security okay, Breach. In the yeah. FNAF 3 minigame that apparently shows us Fred Bear's family diner, he goes back to being gold with a black hat. 
but then in FNAF 4's minigame, he's shown to be gold with a purple hat and bow tie. His appearance has never remained consistent, which could make sense if these are games being made by a guy who's under extreme duress. If Golden Freddy isn't around, then who could have done the bite of 83? Well, it could be that that never happened. We've never seen a gravestone for Crying Child after all. If Golden Freddy doesn't exist, then where does Cassidy's soul reside? Well, again, we still don't have any proof that the original missing children actually possessed any animatronics. All their souls may have just moved on or been immediately converted into remnants. Cassidy only really appears in Ultimate Custom Night, so either their spirit is attached to Afton's like Andrew's is in the Fazbear Fright series, or it's just William torturing himself over the memory of this one child that he murdered in cold blood. Long story short, I still haven't fully worked out the ramifications of all this, and I'd love I... your help working through it because this revelation about the first four games being games demands a whole new way of looking at the series. The, rip <laughs> the first four games being games. <laughs> yeah, that's a revelation, all right? The effects of this revelation are huge, and casts even more doubt into stuff that we thought that we knew about the games. I mean, with all the new books and games and revelations that we've had since the release of Security Breach, I've been meaning to do a State of the Lore video for a while, just to make sure that we're all operating on the same page of what is true and what isn't true. Because at this point, it's hard for even me to keep track of what we've proved, what's <laughs> only speculation, all of that. And after episodes like today, that sort of video feels more important than ever. So keep an eye out for that one in the next couple of weeks. <sighs> I'm back to researching FNAF from square one. Ugh, and I thought we were done with the scary season. But hey, at least never. while I'm pulling my hair out, I can look good well, doing it. FNAF is never new finished. Game Theory merch, which just as. Oh. You know, I will fully admit, I love FNAF and, lo and trying to figure out the lore and stuff. But it can be so, so confusing sometimes. Again, as I said before, I hope this isn't true, because then you're basically chopping off like the first 10 feet of the tree and hoping that the rest of it comes down safely. Ugh, but I don't know. Anyway, uh, yeah, I hope you guys liked. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you have not. And I'll see you guys next time. <sighs> Goodbye.